Brother and Sister Creel with us today. This is Brother Jamison Creel. Would you come and just minister to the people? And I believe God's going to touch hearts and lives today. All right, man. Thank you. That's a that's a big setup. I feel like if I if I think it'll be let down now. Um, and my my technology's failing me as we speak. All right, here we go. Well, first off, let me just do this. I, before I get into anything, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you. Um, w w our family, they, I, they hate, they'll hate this, but I, I'll just make them do it real quick. My family's in the back row. Just all y'all just stand up really quick so everybody can see who we are. There you go. So there's, there's the Creel crew. Okay. One, one of them's in children's church. But we have, this is our last Sunday service. We have been traveling for, since the first week of June. So, and over the course of those two months, we have been, we started in Houston, we went as far east as South Carolina, and as far west as San Jose, California, and, and you know, yeah, last Sunday I spoke in, in California, and we've been spending a whole week working our way back west. We're here tonight, we'll leave here, and my wife, I, I'm a Texan in law, so I, I can't claim to be a full Texan. But I did marry into the club, so I hope you guys will accept me today. Um, so at least I had enough, you know, I, I had enough intelligence to recognize greatness, right? And, and to want to become involved with it. So anyway, I'll save it for later. So, um, well, I'll just, I'll just put it this way. I, I was in my beginning, my fourth year of, of missions work in Israel, working among Palestinian Muslims. And... Um, about a week or two before I was in the States visiting home and I was in, I sat down with my grandfather who just passed away and my grandfather said to me, he said, son, you do want to get married, don't you? I said, yeah, I was 26 by this time. I said, yeah. And he said, well, would you consider there to be a lot of what you would call marriageable girls where you are? And I said, no, not really, not given who I'm working with. And he said, well, this is my grandfather who was a great pastor and minister. He said, well, there's one thing I've learned. And so I'm listening, you know. And he says, if you want ice cream, you go to an ice cream shop. I was like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? You know, <laughs> is there not a shop for girls, is there? And, and if there was, you shouldn't go. So I, I was like, what are you talking about? And so, and so what, he, what he meant was he wanted me to, like, come home for a year or two and go to some, you know, singles ministry somewhere and find a girl to get married to, I guess. And, and I was like, I'm just going to go where I'm supposed to go. Well, so, so I fly back uh, to Israel. Uh, a week or two later, I'm at a Bible study in Jerusalem, and in walks, you know, a 5'9", five 5'10", five blonde, good-looking girl from Texas. And I thought, yes, let's do that. So, <laughs> so, so we're married. We've got the kids. It all worked out. So anyway, I'm, I'm a Texan-in-law by the grace of God. So please accept me on that, you know, those terms. Um, Anyway, I'll, I'll quickly, and, and I, I don't want any, the last thing I would ever want to do from a stage is to glorify myself in any way. I will do a little bit of introduction just to kind of get a little context. We'll go from there. But let me just say first, thank you so much. It is a huge honor any time a congregation opens uh, their arms, their hearts to you, uh, any time a pastor invites you to, to share what I think is very sacred space of your pulpit, it is a huge honor. So I'm very honored to be here today. I thank you so much for having us in, and uh, I, I hope that you are ministered to this day. Quickly, just in introduction, uh, I will say this about myself. Uh, I'm a preacher's kid. I grew up in the South, Alabama and Tennessee, and went to the Church of God's University uh, over in Tennessee to, to Lee. My second year there, my sophomore year would have been in 93, I guess, something like that. I almost died. Uh, if you know anything about the school, there was a big fire uh, that year. I was caught on the second floor of a building that was burning, and I actually dove headfirst out of a window as the ceiling collapsed around me. I mean, it was like straight out of a movie. The, the beams were buckling in the ceiling, and I dove out. It was like a movie except for I'm really clumsy. So as I dove, and instead of just diving, my feet hit the, the window seal. So I kind of went like this straight down and then fell. So I fell at least 15 feet out of a window, landed here, 
and walked away. Utterly unhurt. Both walked away. And and, and I look I look back on that and, and I can still like I really I, I can still like, give myself chills if if I want to think back on that moment and, and the fact that I really should be a, be a quadriplegic. There, there's no way it's normal to fall that far, land on your head and just walk away. And I and that's exactly what happened to me. And and and, and, I, and I knew before, I'd had some other experiences, but I, I really knew coming out of all that that there was a calling, that God God did not just spare me for my sake. You know, God, God like something I believe, you can take it or leave it, this is something I believe, is, is that God uses every single human being on this earth. And, and, and the choice that you get to make is, is does he use you like a son, the way he used Jesus to go to the cross to fulfill his desires, the way he used the disciples to spread the word, does he use you like a son, or does he use you like he used Pharaoh, like a tool? Okay? And, and, and you get to pick. Okay? You get to decide that. And, and, I, and I, kn- I knew that, that God had a, had a calling on my life. But, you know, I was kind of a dumb kid, and I wandered off from that and didn't pay a lot of attention to it. And, and then when I graduated from college, my life was just kind of, I had no direction. You know, I mean, you're 23 years old, and you're supposed to decide, you know, what kind of career to launch into, and I'll make all these decisions. And I just wasn't there. I wasn't ready for that. And so I was really floundering. I'd blown my knee out playing basketball so I could barely walk. And I had all sorts of things going on in my life. And one night I was just complaining over dinner. God, this is awful. I don't know what to do. All my friends separated. I finished my degree, but I don't know what. uh, I was just complaining. And it just so happened that my aunt and uncle were there that night. And and something else I believe in with all my heart is the providence of God, that there are things that you think, just happened, and they didn't just happen. They happened because God arranged them to happen. Okay, you read, if you read the story of, of Ruth, when she goes out into the field, it says that she just so happened to go to Boaz's field, and Boaz just so happened to drop by that day, and he just so happened to see her, and he just so happened, and, 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 and you're like, the author is playing a game with you there. It didn't just so happen. God ordered it to happen, okay? God ordered it to happen. And, and, and what I believe happened in my life was, was it in that night, it just so happened I went to my parents' house for dinner, and it just so happened that my aunt and uncle came over, and it just so happened that I was complaining and moaning. And my aunt says, I know somebody in Jerusalem, and they run a Christian school, and they need help. You should go there for a year while you figure it out. And so 24 years ago, I went to Jerusalem for one year. And that was a long year. Okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm now you know 47, and the wife and the kids, and another different college. All sorts of stuff happened, right? Um, but let me tell you what happened. At the end of my first year, I did not in any way, shape, or form want to go back to Jerusalem. I didn't like it. And and, and I, I I remember throughout the spring of that year, as this, I fulfilled my commitment to do one year. I gritted my teeth and I got through it, and I did what I thought God wanted me to do. And now I'm finished. I'm ready to go home. And sometime around March, April, I kind of felt this thing of, like, you're supposed to come back. This was not just a one-year assignment. And I was like, no, 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 uh-uh. I did what you asked me to do. I'm not coming. And I'll never forget sitting on a stoop, just like this bottom step right here, as parents were picking kids up from school. And one of the kids I'd been working with, I'd been coaching basketball, and he was on my basketball team. He was a ninth grader. He sat down next to me, put his arm around my shoulder, he said, Coach, you're going to be back next year? And I said, no, no. And I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do that. And he looked so sad, and I knew. I knew in that moment I was supposed to be back. I had to tell him, like, God, please, can we do something else? Can we get a different arrangement? And I knew what I was supposed to do. But I'm stubborn, so I dug my heels in, and I went back home for the summer, and I got a job. I enrolled for a master's degree. I had all sorts of stuff. Like, I'm going to move on with my life. And in August of that year, I was driving a car to my parents' house through a curvy, windy road, and I felt guilty, and I, you know, I felt this sort of conviction of God, and I looked up at the heavens. This is would have been 98, so pre-cell phone. I looked up at the heavens, and I said, Lord, if I'm supposed to go back there, they got to call me one more time. I made about two curves, 10 seconds later, pull in the driveway, look up, mom is on the front porch, phone in hand, and she says in her southern Alabama accent, I'm glad you're here, it's somebody from Jerusalem. I was like, 
are you kidding me? So I go, yeah. And they said, please, we need a history teacher. Would you consider coming back? And I said, yeah, give me a week. I'll be on a plane. And, and the rest is sort of history. I went back and, you know, then met Kelly a year or two later. And, you know, it, it, the, if I'm going to summarize my life, I would just use the verse, seek ye first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. Everything I wanted to get by holding out on God, I actually got when I gave my life over to God. You know, I like, so and that's, that's just a sort of summary on me. I wanted to further my education. Well, I got to get a master's degree and study with brilliant people in Jerusalem. I wanted to get a wife and get married. Well, God just brought me a girl from Texas to Jerusalem, and that worked out. And everything I wanted, it happened once I gave my life to God, not when I held out, okay? And so that's kind of me. That's enough of me. Can put, put that aside for a minute? I, I want to talk a little bit about, about God's Word and something that's very key and crucial in the Word of God, okay? Now, I, I don't know you. I, this is my first time here. But my assumption would be that in this room, there are many people, maybe all of the people here, have things in your life you would like to see change. You have things that you would like to see different. You have, you have there's something about your status quo, the way your life is, that if it would change, that would be better. Okay? There's a miracle you want God to perform. There's a blessing you would like to see unleashed. There's something you want done that only God can do is what you were singing about. Okay? And there's an ingredient in your life. There's something that you can't, you will never get that miracle or that destiny you want without this thing. And I want to talk about that for just a minute, and I may even tell you what it is. So I want to I want to look at a verse, and, and really it's a it's it's a it's Luke five. And it's this, it's how Peter became a disciple. But but let's set the backstory for it because the Bible always happens in context, and so obviously Luke five happens after Luke four. That just makes sense, right? And what happens in Luke 4, I'll just summarize it because I don't have time to go through every detail of it. We have to have two services, and, and you want to go to lunch. So in Luke 4, what happens is this. Jesus is rejected in Nazareth. He goes to his hometown. He begins to teach and preach, and they're like, eh, we don't like this. Get out of here. They try to kill him, and he escapes, and he goes. Matthew says he goes to live in Capernaum. Okay, now I want you to get that because a lot of us have this picture in our head of Jesus being like a homeless vagrant. Okay, now Jesus did travel to preach, and I'm sure he did camp and those kind of things and, and, and sort of live rough along the way. And he talks about not having a place to lay his head. Now I get that. But, but it, the Bible also says clearly that for his three ministry years, it says it's in Matthew 4, it says he went to live in Capernaum. He lived, that was his hometown or it was his home base during the ministry years, okay? If you follow his biography. So, and if you, if you take out, you, you know, when I was a kid, we had, still had pews, you know, we, we've, we've moved beyond that to chairs these days. But in the old pews in churches, you know, you had the, the little thing where the books could go and they would have hymnals and they would have Bibles and stuff like that. And if the preacher was real boring, which sometimes they are, I won't get why. When, when I was a kid, we, I would pull out the, the Bible from the pews in front and back in the good old days, they had maps. You, know, you, you guys ever see this? You know, you had like the journeys of Paul, and, and you had Jesus' ministry, all this kind of stuff, right? Those maps in the back. And, it, and, and my dad was the preacher, so don't tell him I said that. But, um, but, it, but if, you know, if I just wasn't into it, I would, you know, I would read the hymnals and read the stuff. And, and, and so if you, if you look on, on those maps and you plot out the ministry of Jesus, what you see is that Capernaum is the, the dot in the middle. It's the, it's the pin that, that where everything's held, and he goes out and he comes back. He goes out and he comes back, okay? Jesus was not from, nor did he live in Jerusalem. He only went to Jerusalem when he had to go. He went for the holidays, for Passover and Sukkot and things like this. He would go to, go to Jerusalem to fulfill the law, and he would come back to Capernaum. Capernaum was his home base. Many of the miracles for the New Testament take place there, okay? So he goes there to live. And Luke 4 gives us a snapshot of one day. What did one day in the life of Jesus look like? Now think about this. Your entire New Testament, if you put it all together, we get a picture of about 50 or 60 of Jesus' days. Now Jesus lived for 33, 34 years, something like this on earth, times 365. You do the math, it's more than I want to figure out right now. But it's a lot of days. We only, we only get a window on 50 or 60 of them. 
okay? Even of his ministry years, you're talking about three years, you know, 11, 1,200 days, and we only see a few of them. John says, if I told you everything, we fill up all the books in the world, I have time for it. Okay, John's like, I, g- I gave you enough that you can believe. So read this, believe on it, you know, it, given the limitations of the time, how much parchment costs, and time writing it by hand, John's like, look, I can't, I've done what I can do. Okay, if you read the last chapter of his book, he says, if I wrote it all down, we fill up all the books in the world, take this. Okay, so we, we have the window on the life of Jesus that God gave us through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, enough that we can believe, okay? But what I want you to envision for a minute, the fact, what would it be like to be in a town where Jesus was in residence? That he lived there. Now, he would go out and come back, but he lived there for over three years. What would it be like if your, you know, your kid breaks his arm and you just, you don't go to a hospital, you just scoop him up and haul him down to Jesus and say, Jesus, we're going to, oh, and you're done, right? And, 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 and people were pouring in to hear him teach, and so you were making money because these people would pour in from all over the place. The Bible says from you know, hundreds of miles they would come in, and, and so they had to eat, and he, he, you, know, you could sell him food. And, and, and it's always entertaining because others go, oh, what did Jesus do today? Oh, my, you know, you could, and there, there's, you know, so there's the entertainment, there's money, there's healing, there's all sorts of things. Wow, it's crazy, okay? And, and, and Luke 4 gives us, again, one snapshot, and what it says is that he goes in the, in the morning to the synagogue to teach, okay? So the synagogue is the Jewish equivalent of, like, going to church. Basically, the, if you ever come with us, I'll take you to Capernaum. We know exactly where this building is. It's still in ruins, but it's still there, and we, and we know exactly where he taught, and you can see the building, and the only difference between how what they did and what we do is that it was in the round, okay? It was like a square, and the, it would be as if I stood in the middle, and this, we put the chairs all around facing towards the center. That's really the only difference, okay? So he would have walked to the middle and taught, and the people were all around him, okay? And it says that as he was teaching, the people began to be astonished. They were kind of annoyed because it said he taught with authority. Now, here's what that means. What that means is that Jesus made pronouncements where he would extend or change a little bit things that Moses said in the Old Testament, like in the Torah, okay? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, th- those books which are the, the center of all life for Jewish people. And Jesus, we know from like Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Jesus would say things like, Moses said... And he would cite a rule, maybe about divorce. Moses said, if you want to divorce your wife, you have to give her a contract of divorce. But I say, unless she's, you know, and, and, and he's changing the, who are you? You can't, you can't do that. You can't, this is a scripture, it's the Bible. You can't make, you can't adjust it. And Jesus is like, well, actually, I can. I can't adjust it. I, I can, I, you know, Moses did that because of your hard hearts and you wouldn't tolerate what you really should be doing. But now I'm telling you what you really ought to do. What on earth? And so Jesus is speaking with authority. See, see, you know, people like me and, and people like Pastor, we, we don't get to speak with authority. We don't, we don't get to say, I, verily, I'd say unto you, thou shalt, we don't, no, we can't do that. What we can tell you is what the word says, okay? But Jesus could go beyond that. And so he's talking like that, and the people are looking around like, what is this? Who is going? And right as that's happening, a, a, a demon manifests in the room. Okay, and the Bible says a demon possessed man began to, to speak out and to shout out, you know, this is a sort of guy. And, and you can imagine, and, and pastors have told me that you guys have had some incidents like this here in the church. So, so you can really imagine it. And, you know, that demon begins to manifest in the middle of the service, how, how much that would be. <gasps> Whoa, and you would, everybody would turn and look, and, it, you know, that would, would kind of shake you up a little bit. I mean, like, wow, I, in my life, I believe on two different occasions I've encountered demon possessed people, and I will say, it's jarring. It's, it's, it, 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 it rattles you a little bit emotionally. It's, it's a big deal. And, and it says in the word that Jesus says, come out of him right now and leave. And the demon just left. And so now these people who are saying, we don't think he has the authority to talk like this. Then he commands the demon. And they're like, well, maybe he does. I don't know. I mean, look what just happened. And it's, you know, and, and so they're all talking about what just happened. Like he talked, he preaches like this, but he commands demons. And we don't know. And it says that they left and they went out and talked all over the area. Now, imagine that happened in church service today, something crazy like that, right? Every single one of you would leave here, and you would go to a Mexican restaurant and talk about it, right? So, nothing has changed. You're going to leave, you're going to go out, you're going to sit at a table somewhere, you're going to talk about it, and the word's going to spread. And that's what happened. 
And then it says that Jesus walked just down the street to Peter's house. And we know where that was too, by the way. Walked just down the street to Peter's house. And there he healed Peter's mother-in-law. And all throughout the evening, people would come and he would heal them and taught. And that's a snapshot on one day. And there were a thousand days like it. Think about that. And in Matthew 11, near the end of Jesus' ministry, Jesus looks at the city of Capernaum where he lived for three years and ministered and taught just like that. And he looks at the city and he says, you, Capernaum, are cursed. Cursed. Look it up for yourself. It's in Matthew 11. You're cursed, he says. If Sodom and Gomorrah had seen what you've seen, they would have repented. And you've seen all this and you haven't repented. And it will not go well for you on that day, he says. To a town of people who witnessed him in the flesh. Can you imagine? Well, why? Why did that happen? It happened because they enjoyed being close to Jesus. They enjoyed the benefits of being around him. But they never accepted him as their personal Lord. Okay? Now, they wanted him to be the Lord of everything else. They wanted him to be the Lord of their neighbor who was not being very nice. They wanted him to be the Lord of the Romans and to stop them from oppressing them. And they wanted him to be the Lord of the people at the, in the temple in Jerusalem and to fix the religious practice. They wanted him to be the Lord of everything else but not me. Okay? And that's what a lot of people do. And a lot of people hang out in churches. They enjoy the benefits. They like the, the society and the social stuff. And, and they, they, you know, they, there's a lot of things about it they like, about Christian culture. But they have not accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, and it will not go well for them on that day. That's what Jesus said. Okay? Now, so there is your context. Roll that forward then to Luke 5. And in that context of this town that's enjoying Jesus being around, but not accepting him, we get a snapshot of a man who does accept him. Okay? And that's Peter. And here's what the Bible says. It says that as the crowd was pressing in, so this is probably just a day or two after Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law. Okay? It's just, it's just, you know, it's literally the next chapter. So it's probably just a few days later, or maybe it's a day or two later. And now the crowds have got the word. They know Jesus is living there. They know Jesus is healing. They know what's going on. They're pressing into the town to hear, to hear from him and to see him. And so the crowd is pressing, pressing, pressing in. He can't even speak because they won't give him space. And so he goes to the waterfront. It's a lakeside town, right? And, and, he, and he finds Peter. Now, now, you have to, this is interesting. If you read Matthew, Luke, and John, you get very different, it seems, versions of how Peter became a disciple. John says that Andrew introduced Peter to Jesus at sort of a John the Baptist event. I'm not sorry, that's, what, yeah, that's, what, that's John's account. Matthew says that Jesus was walking on the lake, said, you should follow me, and Peter said, okay, I'm, I'm in. And Luke gives us the story I'm about to read. So w when you get these kind of situations in Scripture, what you have to accept is that you have to synthesize the three to get the full story, okay? So, so Jesus and Peter had met earlier, as recorded by John, Jesus had been passing by on the lake and saying, you should come follow me, you should come follow me, and they had been developing a relationship, enough so that in Luke 4, Jesus goes to Peter's house, but Peter is not yet a disciple, okay? Then in Luke 5, the, the deal gets sealed, okay? That's how it works, if you, know, if, if you want to read the other accounts of his becoming a disciple. But in Luke 5, Jesus is being pressed by the crowd. He goes to the shore of the lake. He can't even speak because they're just right in his face. He sees a boat owned by Peter, and he pushes out in the boat into the lake. He gets a few feet between him and the shore. And there's a place right there at Capernaum where there's a bit of a cove. And if you imagine, he could have pushed out in the middle of that. The people would have been wrapped all around him, and the shores are steep. They could have stood on the shore, almost like a theater, and he could have spoken. Okay? And I love to imagine that picture of what that was like when Jesus sat in the boat and they stood on the shore, and he just spoke and talked to the people, and, and what would he have been sharing? And it's just a, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And the Bible tells us that while he was doing that, I'll, I'll just read it for you. It says, as the crowd was pressing in on Jesus, he, to hear God's word, he was standing by Lake Gennesaret, which is the same thing as the Sea of Galilee. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down he was teaching the crowd from the boat. Now get this. While he is teaching, they are washing their nets. What the historians, archaeologists tell us 
is that the process of washing, drying, and hanging the nets took two to three hours. Okay? So it's not a short process. These were big nets. Their whole livelihood depended on that net being properly maintained. There was no Bass Pro Shop. Okay? There was no place to run and get a new net. You had to keep it, maintain it, make it. You know, it, this was your baby. It was, this was your money maker. If you lost this, you, you would starve. Okay? So it was a very, very meticulous process of getting everything out of it that might rot, you know, that might cause any kind of deterioration, and hanging properly so it wouldn't tangle. Okay? It took, it took time, two or three hours. What we also know is that these guys fished at night. Okay? Because the fish in the Sea of Galilee don't like the hot sunlight. And the Sea of Galilee is quite hot in the summer. So in, during the summer days, the fish go down to the bottom of the lake, but they'll come up at night when it's cooler. And so the fishermen worked the third shift. They fished all night, which is what Peter's going to say in just a minute. We fished all night. So they have fished all night. If any of you guys have worked third shift, you know what that feels like. You worked all night long. Now it's morning, and we just want to go to bed. Okay? That's where Peter is. And, and he's got, before between him and the bed, is this net cleaning and drying process. And so he's getting that done. Jesus borrows his boat. He's like, okay, I can't go to bed yet anyway. So Jesus is out there teaching. Jesus is probably long-winded, you know, like because people back then taught for a long time. You know, if, if, you re if you read your Bible, it talks about Paul preaching all night and somebody fell out of the window and died, you know, because he was, you know, they just too, went too long. And Paul just went out, resurrected him, and kept on going. You know, like, like these guys would go a long time sometimes. So don't ever get mad at us for teaching too long. Just imagine Paul was here. You'd be falling, falling out. So, but anyway, so Jesus is teaching. Peter's cleaning the net. He's ready to go to bed. And when Jesus finishes, here's what happens. Jesus looks at Peter. He says, when he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down your nets for a catch. The last thing Peter wants to do in that moment is to let down his net for a catch. He just wants to go to bed. He's tired. He's been up all night. He sat there cleaning the nets out while Jesus taught, trying to be a nice guy and loaning his boat. Now he just wants to go to bed. And Jesus says, hey, let's go out there and throw the net in one more time. And what Simon Peter knows is if I throw that net in one more time, now I've got another two or three hours before I can go to bed. What he also knows is there's no fish. Now it's daylight. It's hot. The fish are down low. It's a deep lake. They're not going to get anything. I'm going to waste my time to catch nothing. And also, throw this out there, he's already in a bad mood. Because he's going to tell us in a minute, we fished all night and caught nothing. So imagine you work an entire third shift and make nothing. No money for your labor. And now you want to go to bed. He's grumpy. Okay, I don't know if you've ever been grumpy before, but, you know, I occasionally get grumpy. He's, he's, he's grumpy. He's in a bad mood. He's tired. And Jesus asks him for one more thing, and he wants to say no. Because if you read his, read his response, he says, I'll read the first part. He, he, this is in 5-5. Uh, five, five. He says, Master, we worked hard all night and caught nothing. Now let's pause right there before we read the next sentence. See, we, we read the Bible, and we read it already knowing how it's going to end. Because we've been in church all of our lives. We've been in Christian culture. So we kind of know how the book ends. We don't have the glorious blessing of, of reading it the first time. Okay? We don't, I, when I work with Muslim guys, and we're discipling new believers who've come out of Islam, I get to read with them the Bible for the first time. And it's really, really cool. So they just, just a, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, I guess two or three months ago, or a few months ago now, um, I was in a Bible study, and we were going over the prodigal son. And these guys never read it before, you know? And so, so I'm kind of reading the story and talking to them, and I'm like, and the son decided to go home. What do you think the father did? Now, we all know the father reacts to greet the son. These guys didn't know. They're like, what did he do? Did he kill him? Did he hit him? Did he, did he accept him as a slave? Like, these guys are all like, well, what did he do? And I'm like, he ran out and hugged him. And they're like, no, really? So, so we, we, I mean, it, it, it's, you have to think about your Bible with fresh eyes sometimes. 
because we just know it, and so we don't think about it, right? But, but think through a fresh eye for, 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 for just a minute here, because we already know that Peter is going to be something amazing, okay? We all already know he's going to be the leader of the disciples. We already know he's going to become so spiritually powerful that his shadow heals people. We already know he's going to walk on water. We already know he's going to he's going to speak on the day of Pentecost, step out, and thousands of people will believe. And a few days later, he'll step into Solomon's portico in the temple, and he'll speak again, and thousands of people will come to faith. Right? We we know he'll travel all over the Mediterranean world, winning people. We know he'll write books in the Bible. We we know that right now, this day, the largest church in the world is built over the site of his death. Okay, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It's a church so big. You could play a legal football game inside of it. It's 75 yards wide and 150 yards long. It's the biggest thing I've ever been in. Built to honor this man over the site of his death. But on this day, he's not that guy yet. He's just an angry, grumpy, third shift, blue-collar worker who wants to go to bed. It's all he is this day. And Jesus says, I need you to do one more thing. And his heart says, have you been there? Have you been in that moment? Have you been in that moment where you know the Lord is asking something of you and the last thing you want to do is what he's asking? Where you're like, oh, come on, Jesus, that, that, you're going to ask me that? And, and you know it and you know it, right? Every single one of us, unless somehow you are a completed work of God, lives in that moment or has that moment from time to time. Even Jesus himself had that moment. Read Jesus in the garden. In the garden, Jesus looks at the Father and says, is there something else we can do? Can, can, we, can we work, can we, can we do this a different way? All of us are going to have that moment. And what I want to tell you is, when you stand in that moment, you stand at a crossroad that you don't even know about. And on one side is your status quo never changes. And if Peter looks at Jesus that day and says, you know what, I'm not doing that. Never changes. We don't know his name. He never becomes that guy. He's just another person in Capernaum that rejected Jesus. The other direction is you say yes. And on the other side of your yes is a miracle and your destiny. And you have to choose. It's not easy. So what happened on this day, just to sort of read it, is Peter says, we worked hard all night and caught nothing, but... If you say so, I'll let down the nets. So you've got to get that. He doesn't want to. But he says, if you say so, then I'll do it. And that's where you, that's enough. That's enough. Get to that point where in faith and in obedience, you can look at God and say, I don't want to do this. But if you say so, I will. And God will take that. And what happened in Peter's life is it says, when he did this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came, and they filled both boats so full they began to sink. And when Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees. And he said, go away from me, because I'm a sinful man. And Jesus in that moment says, hey, from now on, you're going to be catching men. You're going to be a fisher of men. Come on with me. Because, because it just took the moment of obedience to unleash his miracle and his destiny, okay? And in that moment, Peter realizes who the Lord is. See, and, and, and he said, I don't deserve to be around you. And Jesus said, that's why I needed you all along. Now let's go. And that's all you got to do. That's all you got to do to unleash what you want to see in your life, okay? Now let's ask a question because, uh, you know, I, maybe you're a little interested in, in what we're doing in the world. And the question that needs to be asked is, I'm a 24-year veteran of evangelizing and ministering to and discipling Muslims, uh, primarily Palestinian Arab Muslims in Israel. Why am I moving? Because I'm moving. And the answer is that. It's obedience. Because I believe when I believe anything else in my life that God has asked me to step into something different. And there was a moment it was on February 18th this past year, a day we will never forget in our household. When in, I was praying, I always prayed on, the, our house had a, a balcony up on the roof. I always prayed up there. And as sharply as anything I've ever like, really heard from the Lord, you know, I, I, the word 
first was in the head was they want to let it go. Or let them have it. They, there were some people who wanted to step in and, and to take over administration of the school that I had built for the last 10 years. And that was my baby, and I loved it, and I loved that community. I still love that community and those people deeply, and there's home there. I raised my kids there. The last thing I wanted to do was leave, but I, but I just felt that I was supposed to release that work and even leave the country that I lived in for 24 years that I loved. And that was heartbreaking. I talked to my kids. We all cried together. My oldest son cried, my middle daughter. Everybody cried. I cried. I cried for two weeks, you know. But we, but I knew it was time. And what the Lord called us to. And, and okay, so be obedient to why. And I, I, I want to share one other, one other scripture with you guys. Um, it's in John 4. It's after the one, it's after the one at the well incident. So if you know the one at the well, Jesus goes to Samaria. Samaritans and Jews hate each other. You know, men and women don't really talk to each other. Add to that the fact that she was not a quote unquote good girl. And Jesus goes to minister to this woman. He speaks to her. She goes into the town. She tells everybody what's happened. They're going to come out. And it, in, the, in the gap between the woman going back into town, the disciples come out, and Jesus is talking to them. And, and it kind of goes like this. They're like, did you get lunch? You know, like, what did you do? And, and he's like, oh, I was talking to this girl. They're like, what? what how is and and they, don't, they don't get it, you know, like what's going on. And then regarding the harvest, he said this. He says this. Don't you say, this is, this is John 4.30. 35, don't you say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? So in other words, he's like, normally about the harvest, you guys say, it's coming, it's coming. I'm telling you, it's now. Okay? He says, open your eyes and look at the fields because they're already ready for the harvest. The reaper is already gathered. He's, he's like, look, because pro- what was probably happening is the woman had gone into the town and the people were now coming back out to hear Jesus. And, and, and no Jew ever thought that the Messiah was going to go talk to Samaritans. They just they couldn't wrap their heads around that. And as these people are coming, he's like, look, the fields are ready. You see them? They're ready. And, and, they're, you know, and the disciples are like, whoa, I don't get it. But, but, I, but I want you to get the, the, the language that he used there. Look at the field. They're ripe for harvest. See, the, the Bible from Genesis really on through to the end talks in a number of occasions about what I would call a look of desire. Okay? Eve looks at the apple. It looks good. I want it. And then she goes through a process of letting herself be convinced or convincing herself it's okay. And then she sins. The Bible talks about like the lust of the eyes, how you look at something and you want it, and then you're, you're going to justify it. You're going to go through a process by which you eventually end up sinning to get the thing you decided you wanted. Jesus says, if you look at the woman to lust after her, right, that's a sin. You know, she's married, and then you're married, and that, that abounds, and that's bad. You shouldn't be doing that, okay? But these, these, these are all conversations about, like, looking with a look of lust or desire to want something. And generally speaking, in the Bible, we are warned against this. But in this case, he says, do it. Look at the field that's right for so Look at that. You always want to look at, at, at money and women and whatever the thing is. You, you always want to look with desire at things, and they're bad for you. I'm telling you, look at this with desire. Look at the field, look at the harvest. Look, 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 look at what you're supposed to be going after. And, and so that is what we're trying to do, is to look at the harvest with desire. Now, I'm looking across the room. Let me see this can in the room. Yeah seems that there are a few couples throughout the room that might be married around here. And if you're married, I can make an assumption. And the assumption is that somehow you went from zero to married. Okay? There was a day when you didn't know each other. There was a day you met each other. And then somehow there was a process that ended up with, I'm, you know, let's be a traditionalist, I hope, the man saying, would you marry me? And the girl said, I will, and then you had a, a wedding, and now you're married, you got kids, and life's great. Now, I hope. So, how does that happen? I can tell you how it happened, and how it happened for me is I had that conversation with my grandfather I talked about. A few weeks later, my Kelly walks into Bible study. I thought, I want that one, and now I'm going to pursue it, right? So, how, how, do you, how do you pursue? What do you do? 
you, you change your life. You, I, I, I wanted to look really put together. I wanted to be really good at work. So, you know, look, I'm, you know, I'm getting promoted. I'm, you know, people trust me with stuff around here. I'm a solid guy. You know, I wanted to do good. I, I was working on a master's degree. I wanted to do good academically. Like, hey, I've got a future. I'm putting myself together. Look at me. You know, I, I wanted to look good, look together, look like the kind of guy you'd want to be with. I wanted to be nice. Nicer, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, maybe I'm not so nice to everybody else, but to you, ooh, I'm real nice to you, right? You know? And, 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 you, and you change yourself and do, you do things you wouldn't normally do, okay? Um, the, the best example I can give you of that is this. So, if you, back when people still had DVDs, you know, like these days I feel like everything's just streaming, but back when people had DVDs, if you looked at my collection of DVDs, it was very like masculine, manly people, you know, soldiers and swords and, you know, it was, it was thing, you know, like brave heart and, and the glad, you know, like, you know manly rawr, stuff, right? In my personal collection of videos, there were, to the best of my knowledge, not a single romantic comedy. And there was not, there was no, you know, like period piece dramas, you know, set in the 1800s kind of stuff. Like, like I didn't have any of those. And, and to the best of my knowledge, I have never gone of my own volition by myself to watch a movie and thought, let's put this in and landed on anything like that. Okay. But my wife loves Jane Austen. Pride and Prejudice, that kind of stuff. And so as we were approaching marriage one night, she says, well, if we're going to be getting married, you should see my favorite movie. And I'm thinking, you know, a couple hours on the couch, I'll go with Kelly. Yeah, sure, I'll do it. And I'm like, yeah, no problem. Let's watch it. And she goes and comes back with, it's multiple discs. <laughs> it, was, it was the five-hour BBC version of Pride and Prejudice. And I sat on a couch for five hours and watched Jane Austen and acted like I liked it. Okay? <laughs> Why? Because I had a desire that I wanted to fulfill. I wanted to land the girl, and that was a part of the process to do it. Now, let's switch that to the harvest, which Jesus tells us to do. So what does it mean? It means you look at the harvest, and you think, I'm willing to change myself. I'm willing to be a better person. I'm willing to, to work on me. I'm willing to do things I don't want to do. I'm willing to be inconvenienced. Whatever it takes to land the harvest, I will do. Okay? So what is then the harvest we're called into that we're, we're going to be working on? I'll show you really quick. Let, let, I, I think, can we tee up those pictures? Maybe picture one. All right. So there's something going on in this world that very few people know about. And again, I've got 24 years of experience of working in the evangelization of Muslims. That's what, like, if I could, if I could see one thing in my life, it would be the absolute collapse of Islam. Like, uh, that's sort of what I'm geared at. And so, there are four countries: Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and Syria that make a big block. You can see they're all adjacent to each other. And those four countries are all either totally collapsed, or, in the case of Iran, are currently collapsing. Okay. And refugees, by the hundreds of thousands, even by the millions, are pouring or have been pouring out of those countries for the last several years. And, and a few years back, we started working with some of those refugees that were coming into Jordan out of Syria, and we started to work there. And we have a team under our administration in Oman that's continuing to do that work. But for years, to at least two or three years now, we've been praying about the vast majority of these people because they go into Europe. And, and the, the entry point into Europe for the vast majority of them is Greece. And we've been to Athens several times, and it's just the city is a, awash with, with refugee and other people, just full of them. And we've been praying, like, God, what do you, what do you want? Do you want us to help somebody minister here? Do you want us to minister here? Do you want us to just pray for this? Like, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? And, and I feel like more clearly than anything else I've ever heard is that God is like, I want you to go do this. And so out of that country, millions of people, they flow. They walk from their homes all the way across their home countries, across other countries. They get to Turkey. Turkey's twice as big as Texas, by the way. They walk all the way across Turkey from the east side to the west side. Okay? So imagine walking across Texas twice, you know, you know, from Orange to El Paso, I guess. Is that the, is that the, is that the full length? Well, you know, yeah, imagine doing that and then going back. Okay? So I, I just a few weeks ago, I was in... Uh, Greece, and I was at a refugee camp, 
and I met this boy. He was 10 or 12 years old from Afghanistan. And I was like, how did you, well, first I said, where are you from? He says, Afghanistan. Okay. How did you get here? I said, walking. Can you imagine that? That's across like two and a half countries. You know, part of Afghanistan, all of Iran, all of Turkey, they're huge countries. And then what? We got on the raft. See, what happens, they, they get all the way across Turkey to the coast of Turkey, western coast of Turkey, and there are Greek islands just off on the horizon. Okay? They're, the Greek this, this, this is a picture on Samos. It's only two and a half miles from Samos over to, to the mainland of Turkey. Uh, there's another island called Lesbos that we were on. It's only six miles from, you know, from coast to coast there, from the Greek coast of the island over to the Turkish mainland. And they get there, and then they'll get a, a life jacket, and they'll get a raft of some sort, or they can improvise, and they try to paddle across. And they do this by the thousands and thousands. Okay? And so what you're seeing there is a picture of a camp where people, you're on the hill above a beautiful, beautiful little coastal port town here in heaven, and you look up on the hill and you see thousands of people living in horrible, horrible lives. And so those are just makeshift tents. People just steal what they can, build a little tent, live in it for years sometimes, two, three years or more, living like that. Show the next one, please. Okay, that's a picture from a little bit above the camp. These are all tents that these guys have built. And then down below you see the port where the, where the boats pull in. Okay, so now the question is, what does the Bible say about it? And, and here, and I'll show you a verse really quick. This is Matthew 17, verse 26. Let's see if we can get to there. I think I messed you up, right? Did I? Oh, I'm sorry, Acts 17, 26. Yeah, I, I, you know, sorry. <laughs> I'll just apologize, move on. So I as we were praying through all this and thinking about it, I really feel like the Lord just gave us the scripture as the base of what we were doing. Paul says this while he's standing on Mars Hill in Athens, which is why we've named our ministry the Mars Hill Initiative, which is based on this verse. He says, what Paul says is from one man he made all the nations. They should inhabit the whole world and marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. If you read other translations, it'll say that God appointed the boundaries of their dwelling or of where they live. Okay? So, so here's what that means. That means if people, Afghani people, used to live here, but now hundreds of thousands of them live over there. This was appointed by God. It wasn't an accident. It didn't happen. God did it. I mean, it's clearly stated, unless your Bible's lying to you, that God appoints the boundaries and the time of the nation. If the boundary changes, where these people were living has been altered, it's because God did it. Clearly stated. Okay? Why? Next verse. He says, it says, God did this. They would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Do you get that? Why are people from Afghanistan and Syria and Iran and Iraq, why did they used to live here and now they live here? So they'll find God. So they'll find God. That's why they were moved. They were moved because God loved them enough that he wouldn't let them just be happily, happily rock along through their lives and go to hell. He broke their country. They've had war and turmoil, all sorts of horrible things, because God loves them enough to not let them go happily to hell. And now they're going to a place where people like me can minister and witness. See, I couldn't go to Afghanistan and witness openly. It was a very strict Muslim country. They killed me within a week, right? I mean, there's story after story of, of Christian ministers who've gone to those countries and, and, and died or been imprisoned. They couldn't go there. But I can go to Greece, France, Germany, all those countries. I can go and say whatever I want. So they've been moved to a place where they can find God. And so w what we're doing is, to the best of my knowledge and my ability, participating in what God is doing. Okay? And unless the Bible's lying to me, this is what God is doing. And it's not lying. And so we want to get involved. And I love, I love Big Valley Bible Church. Love it to the bottom of my heart. I love those people, but we've got to go and seize this opportunity for the sake of the kingdom and for the sake of the harvest. That's just what's happening. I believe with all my heart it was the greatest opportunity in the last 500 years to minister to the nation of Afghanistan, and we're going to go grab it. So that's what we're doing. Now, let me tell you this in, in closing. There is nothing on this earth that I, well, I probably shouldn't say nothing. There are a few things on this earth that I despise more than trying to raise money. I hate it. 
I wish he was not a part of my life. But, but there's a problem. And the problem is, I have a picture in my head of about a 12-year-old girl from Afghanistan. And, and I can't go save her by myself. I can't. And the more help we have, the more girls like that and boys like that and men and women like that that we can, we can affect. And so, because of the burden and the calling that God has put on us and me and my family, then I have to ask for help. Because, because God made a body, and different parts of the body have different functions. And I'm a very strange, weird, specifically designed tool that's good at going and doing what I do, but I need help to go do it. And that's just the reality. And, and, and so, yeah, that's why we're here. I'm not going to lie to you. That is why we're here. It is that I hope that you've been ministered to this day, but that in return, I hope that you guys will help equip us to go do what God's called us to do. And, and, and that's what we're kind of all about, is we are going to get this harvest. How can you help? There's two or three things you can do. Number one, you pray for us, because we desperately need God to do some miracles in our life. Okay? You know, we're, frankly, we're about a week from homeless. So we, we had some housing things fall through. And we need to figure out where we're going to be living literally in a week. Um, we need the funding to move from here to there. We need God to open some doors in Greece so we can get into ministry and get visas. You know, pray for us because there's a lot of crazy, crazy change in front of us. Second, financial support. You know, I'm sure one-time offering today gets us down the road. That's awesome. Monthly support is even better. You know, I'm sure you can do it through the church. You can do it through our website. You know, third, this is a crazy one, come out and work. In a year, August of next year, we're going to be up and running with our ministry there. You know, we're taking this year to do all the planning and the, the advanced work. I'm going to be going back and forth between Greece and here. My family's going to be here for a year. I'll be doing some fundraising and some travel and some setup on that side. But by fall of next year, we're up and running. We're going to be teaching English language classes like ESL or TESOL classes as a way to get these refugee people to come to our center, and then we're going to be sharing the gospel in that context. That's going to be sort of our, you know, game plan to start. And we need people, you know, so if you want to teach English to people from Afghanistan and Syria and places like that and talk about Jesus a bit, you know, come out and work in a year. Pray about that. So that's kind of where it is. If it is okay in this moment, I would like to just pray. In closing, I'd like to pray for you guys and for this house and the ministry of, of this place. I would like to pray for, for us, and then I would like to pass things over to Pastor John to, to close us out. <laughs> Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you so much for the ministry of, of this church, a legacy church here in this town in Wichita Falls. I, I thank you because it is apparent, it is readily apparent, just by looking around, that you are doing things here, that you are, that you are changing this place, and that your kingdom is being manifested in these people and what goes on here. And Lord, I thank you for it. And, and, and God, I thank you for the calling that you've placed on our lives and the direction you, you've sent us in. And I thank you for, for new friends. And, and, and I thank you for, for just a wonderful, wonderful congregation to, 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 to join us today. And, and God, I just want to pray your blessing on this house and on these people. Lord, we talked today about obedience and being obedient to you when we don't want to. And Lord, I don't know exactly where everybody in the house is. I don't know what's going on in their families and their lives. But Lord, I pray that you give them courage and the faith to step out in obedience to you. Whether it's a, a sin thing they need to get rid of, whether it's a service they need to step up into, you know, whether it's a relationship that should be mended. Lord, whatever it is that, that they're holding out on you, Lord, I pray that you would just give us the power, the courage, the faith to release things to you and to step into what you want us to be. And, and, and Lord, I, I just pray that as that process works its way through this congregation, that, that a stunning, wonderful, awesome revival and growth in these people will happen here. And Lord, pr I pray for the, for the pastor and his family. I pray for everything about this place. And Lord, I, I pray for, for my family and our ministry. Lord, help get us down the road where we're supposed to be. Land us in the right place. Help us to get through this year of, of preparatory work and then launch out into the field. We thank you for all of that. And we pray. Amen. Amen. Did you enjoy that word this morning?
this couldn't have happened on a better week for several different reasons. Number one, uh, I have a allergy attack that has just about killed me, so that's why I sound the way I sound. But let me say this. Um, I felt something in my spirit grab me while he was speaking, and uh, I do not want to preach, although I really, actually, I do want to preach, but I'm not going to. Um, you said it's okay to let go. God spoke to you and said it's okay to let go, and something in my spirit jumped on me and said there are a few people in here today that needed that that it's okay to let go because God's got something he's going to transition you to. I don't mean you're going to move across the ocean, but it doesn't mean you're you're not either. I just feel like God's trying to tell somebody, don't settle for good when he has great. I'm sure you've all heard the little story before, and I'll just tell you this little story whose daddy gave her a pearl necklace. It was a fake, and it was the most prized thing she had. They were very poor. And after a few years, God started to bless them. And he went to her and said, I want you to give me that little necklace. And she said, no, it's mine. I want it. I'm keeping it. He went back to her a few days later and says, I really want that necklace. And she started sobbing and bawling it. She said, Daddy, no, I love this necklace. I I don't know why you're trying to take it from me. And he went back a week later, and she was just sobbing and bawling. And he says, Honey, I really want that necklace. And she said, No. She said, Daddy, this is mine, but if you want it that bad, I'll give it to you. And she takes this little fake pearl necklace thing off, plastic beads, and she gives it to her dad, and he pulls out of his coat pocket a beautiful, authentic diamond necklace worth thousands. And he said, I've had this for weeks to give to you, but I couldn't get it to you until you would give up what you had. Listen. We here at Legacy Church have been through, the last two years have been through, we've been through a lot. Some of you personally, on a personal level, uh, the deaths, the sicknesses that your family has been through. It's been crazy. We went through COVID where we couldn't have church. We had church in the parking lot, which was just absolutely awful last year in the summer. How many of y'all remember? Well, you were sitting in your cars when we had the radio transformer. and You could beep your horn for an amen, but I had to stand on that trailer in the heat and sweat to death. It was awful. I'm tell you something. You can talk about the good old days all you want. I like air conditioning. Hold on a minute. I felt the Holy Ghost right there saying air conditioning. I like it. We get back into our church. We make plans for 2021. Texas goes through the most astronomical thing that's ever had. Snow on the ground in every single county. And what happens? We come into church one morning and there's a pipe that burst and the entire church is flooded and we are still that happened in I think February and we are still finishing up the cleanup on it how many of y'all like the outside of the church the way it's looking right now come on isn't it looking good it's looking really good the inside is completely different there's still a few things we have to do but in the next few weeks the brick will be done on the front the brick will be done on the sign the roof will be completed We've got a couple little things we're doing in here yet, which we'll probably always have something we always do a little bit, but we're getting close to being finished. And let me tell you something, as of right now, my treasure is sitting right in the corner. As of right now, we haven't spent any personal money to do it. God has blessed us. Now, I'm saying as of right now, we are about to, Paula, we're about to reconcile everything right at the moment. We're in the process of finding out where we're standing. But when God has been so good to you, you have to, you have to bless other people. The reason why we are blessed is because we are a giving church and we have always been that way. 
Brother Jameson said something to me last night. It was real hot. We ate at Samurai last night, and his wife and kids went to their car. You want to see something fun? You want to see all of them get into one car. That little Volvo went right down to the ground. <laughs> I was going, wow, man, they all get in there with all that luggage. Holy cow. Um, so uh, his family went to the car. Sherry and Harry went to the Jeep, and we were standing out there talking, and I'm going to tell this little story, and then I'm going to stop. He said, I don't know how you believe, but he said, this is how I believe. If I was the president of Greece, I would shut the border down, and I would not allow people to come in. He said, if I was the president of America, I would shut the borders down, and I would not allow people to come in. Well, I agree with that. Absolutely, I would do it. But... This is what got me. I told my wife when we got when I got into the car, I, all of a sudden his eyes, sorry, he started to tear up and he said, but we have a bunch of kids here who don't know who Jesus is that are already here and are already there and they keep coming. And he said, regardless of what our beliefs are, somebody's got to reach those kids. Come on, amen. Jesus didn't say, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest only in America or only in Israel. I always say it this way. Jesus says, come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, the punk, the monk, and the skunk, everybody. Amen, everybody. You want to make a change in this world? You want to stop the jihadis and all this kind of stuff? Get them while they're young. Why do you think the government here is trying to get our kids out from underneath us while they're young? They want you to, they, they know that you have more influence than anybody over those kids. So they're trying to get them out of your covering and indoctrinate them in something else. And if they can get those kids while they're young, when they're in high school, they'll look at you and go, you're just out of touch. You don't understand. That's why I believe we, as parents and grandparents, to this day, right now, we still need to have more influence than a football coach, a soccer coach, a t-ball coach, anybody, your youth pastor, your young adult pastor, your pastors, your elders and deacons and parents, you need to have more influence than anybody on your children. And if you want to change other people in this world and you want to see this world change, I'm going to tell you something. We have to get those kids while they're young. I sat there and thought about that all night long. I could hardly sleep. I thought about it all night long going, I'm a big advocate and a big mouth about close them borders, close them borders. But then I heard you read that scripture. Why is God doing that? He's relocating them so they could get the word in their communist country. They may never hear about Jesus. So what does he do? He scatters them. It gives us the opportunity to do what we are called to do, and that's not sit in church, but that is to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've been here going uh, in just a couple weeks. I'll start my 13th year of ministry here, and all I've preached since I've been here is the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. Jesus did not preach ecclesia, the church. He didn't preach that. It's only mentioned one or two times in the Bible. He always talked about the kingdom. And the kingdom is more than a denomination and more than the United States. Come on, amen. Brother Mike, would you and Nathan, Nathan, would you guys come up here? There's some offering buckets here. Here's what I'd like us to do in closing today. I told you all, the church has a, de a designated offering that we're going to give. Um, on top of that, though, we want to collect another offering. And here's what I want us to do. If you are going to write a check, you can make the check out to Legacy Church. We're going to write one check at the end of the day. If you want to use our giving station out in the foyer, Brother Steve went out there already and he set it up that you can, is it called missionary? I didn't bring my phone. Missionary offering. If you go and use your card, you can put missionary offering, uh, mark it as missionary offering, and Paula will be able to uh, tell the difference between tithe and uh, the offering today. We're not going to take anything out. Everything that you give, if you want to write a post-dated check and say, could you hold this for a week, we'll do that. Just make sure it's good in a week, okay? If you want to do something like that, I want to bless them. I really do. Now, he didn't mention the table he's got in the back here of stuff. Um, 
that's probably how they would support you monthly if they chose. Yes. Okay, so there's stuff back there, or you can see him or his. He says that's his wife, but I kind of, after talking to her last night, I thought it was his daughter. Uh, she's much, I mean, she looks the same age as all her kids, the, the two older daughters. But um, if, you would, uh, if you would like to talk to them, they can direct you, give you the direction. But I really want to bless them. This is one of the things that I have not asked this church to do in 13 years. We haven't done much missions around here. We've been doing city mission. That's all we have worked on. In a few weeks, I'm going to introduce you to another family that's been here for the last couple weeks. And I, I just want to say this to you. I hope you never leave. I hope you stay here forever. We'll use you on the bass. We'll rotate you in and out on all the, the drums, the, the piano. We'll, you, we'll make sure God has a place for you. Uh, our drummer was excited to hear there was another drummer. He, I mean, that poor guy, he looks like Animal on the Muppet Show back there all the time. Now, Afton, Afton, his wife, I don't know who posted the picture, but there was a picture of him when y'all first met on Facebook the other day. Was it him? And he said, what happened to us? That was not very smart. You should have said, what happened to me? What have you? you never implicate your wife. She's had children. You haven't. Okay? So uh, what happened? And see, he's lost 35, 40 pounds playing the drums since he's been here because he sweats to death. But, so we hope you never leave. And I can't wait to partner with them. They're going to show you some stuff that they're doing that is absolutely incredible as well. Um, it's amazing. But today, I want to be a part of what the Creole family is doing. I want to be a part of it. And uh, I'm going to talk to our treasurer uh, when we're done. And I want to, uh, I want her to uh, take something out of my check for me next week to, to uh, uh, help as well. But I really want to bless them. The giving station is open. You can use that market missionary offering, and we will know what it is. But I really want them to leave here blessed today. Somebody's got to reach Muslims. Somebody has to. Jesus, oh, could I preach right now? Man, could I preach right now? Where this goes all the way back to Hagar and Sarah. God told Hagar he wouldn't forget her. He wouldn't forget her offspring. This is where we are today. This is the offspring. And I'm going to tell you something. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. God wants to bless and use this family. They are giving up what they started walking away from security and if I, I tell you something I know what that's about I have walked away from my security from my family and friends and a church that was very lucrative to come here to a church that was smaller than our children's church our children's church was bigger than this church was back in 1990 99 when I moved here and now look what God is doing here this is incredible I know what it's like to have to leave and walk away and start over. I want to bless them. I want to bless them. I'm sorry, it wasn't 99. Was it 2000? I can't remember. It was, yeah, it was 2009. What am I saying? I am like getting really old. I can't even remember my own name anymore. Yeah, it's the gray hair. Yeah, thanks from a guy coming with gray hair and a big old beard and everything else. Thank you, Sister Melissa. I saw you whisper to your husband and I went, wait a minute. <laughs> Kayla was born in 898, so we started pastoring our first church in 99. That's what it was. I knew that. I knew that. I just wanted to make sure she knew and remembered. So if you'll stand with me real quick, I want to receive an offering. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I want to receive an offering for this family today, and I want us to bless them. I want us to bless them. You can use the giving station if you'd like missionary offering. Anything you write a check or whatever you do, make sure you write it to Legacy. and We will write one check at the end of this all today. Father God, I love you, and I thank you, God, for the ministry of the Creole family. God, for all the years they have put in to ministering to Muslims in Israel. God, I just think that's a phenomenal thing. God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to every person in this church today. God, our local church here has needs, but God, I feel like this need trumps everything, and I ask you that you would speak to their hearts today. 
and that you would move in their lives and God that you would do something great for them I pray God that what we sow today will be sown back into individual lives and in this church God you see the need we have here and God what we give today I pray is just a seed to give back to what we need Father I pray Lord that you bless every person speak to their lives in Jesus name we pray Amen. You can bring an offering to the front. You can use the giving station. And with that, we will dismiss you. I love you all. God bless you.